Feinstein, Walter P. Stern Distinguished Fellow here at Hudson Institute. And I'm honored to welcome the 28th Prime Minister of Australia, Tony Abbott, to Hudson Institute today. It's a delight to be with you once again. For our audience, let me just say a little few biographical snippets. You began your career in Australia as a uh, journalist, uh, including at The Australian, for whom uh, you continue to write regularly today and with uh, great insight. First elected to Parliament in 1994, you held the Health Ministry under Prime Minister John Howard. You eventually rose to opposition leader, head of the Liberal Party in 2009 before winning election and serving as Prime Minister from 2013 to 2015. Now, on, on the international affairs side, your tenure was a, a remarkable one, uh, marked by numerous landmark agreements, including free trade agreements with Japan, Korea, and the People's Republic of China, most notably. And you also made the critical decision for Australia to improve its defense capabilities by the acquisition of submarines, which policy that was a decision that was later implemented by your successors, and on which there's obviously been a major recent announcement. But you've just come back, you're here in Washington following a landmark visit to Taipei, where you met with President Tsai. You delivered uh, two major speeches to the people of Taiwan. Uh, now, traditionally, Australia and Taiwan have not had the kind of close relationship that the United States and Taiwan have. There's no Taiwan Relations Act in Australia. Uh, there's no direct security relationship. Let's talk a little bit about your trip. Uh, how did it go? Uh, how was your message received and where you see the future of Taiwan and the future of Australian-Taiwanese relations. Thanks for having me, Ken. It's wonderful to be here at the Hudson Institute, which has been a very, very significant part of the defence and foreign policy debates over the last couple of decades. Look, uh, I was very keen to go to Taiwan because I think that Taiwan is really now the front line of freedom. Uh, it is under existential threat uh, from China uh, and the least Democrats like myself can do is to show a bit of solidarity uh, with the people under such challenge. Uh, I was uh, delighted to meet with President Tsai and uh, people like uh, Foreign Minister Joseph Wu. Uh, they are very much aware of the uh, precariousness of their position. I think they are determined to do everything they can uh, to remain a wonderfully invigorating uh, outpost of freedom and a wonderful demonstration that there is no totalitarian gene in the Chinese DNA. But that is precisely why President Xi Jinping, the Red Emperor, uh, is keen to take them because as long as Hong Kong was there, uh, that was a, if you like, an existential challenge to the communist mindset. And as long as Taiwan is there uh, as a free place, that's an existential challenge uh, uh, to the communists' philosophy. So, so this, this really counts. It really, really counts. And I don't think the American public, the Australian public, the British public, the Japanese public, I don't think any of us have quite yet grasped just how fraught the situation across the Taiwan Straits is right now and how difficult and dangerous it could get quite quickly. And your sense of it, let me ask you about the Taiwanese public mm -hmm. and your, your, your interactions such as they were with, say, ordinary Taiwanese outside of the policy mm -hmm. elites. What's your sense of how they feel? Look, uh, I think for a long time, uh, the Taiwanese public assumed that American protection uh, meant that they would be safe. Uh, what I think they're suddenly realising is that almost without us realising it, China now has the capability of inflicting massive damage on the US Navy, uh, dreadful, catastrophic damage on the US Navy, which suddenly makes a cross-straits assault possible in a way that it wouldn't have been until maybe five years ago. As I said, we've been distracted by many things, whether it was uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, climate change, the virus, um, Iran. I'm not saying these aren't important. Of course they're important. And yes, they deserved the West's collective attention. But uh, 
the China challenge, particularly as it focuses on Taiwan, uh, is now, well, it should be now absolutely front and centre because if someone asks me, what am I scared of? Well, I'd be a lot more scared about a shooting war with China than I would be about uh, a couple of degrees rise in temperature over the next 50 or 60 years. You, 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 you brought up uh, Xi Jinping and uh, when you were prime minister, you, you concluded, uh, noted earlier, the free trade agreement mm -hmm. with China, the first mm -hmm. uh, free trade agreement with the G20 country. Mm -hmm. You also welcomed uh, Xi Jinping to, uh, to Canberra to address the Australian parliament. Mm. Um, and um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, you like many in the United States, you're, you're known, you were known as a ch champion of free trade, a mm. great champion of free mm. trade, and you're still quite involved uh, in promoting trade both for Australia and for the United yeah. Kingdom. Uh, like many in the United States, especially those who champion Chinese accession to the World Trade Organization, you've come to have serious regrets about your position. I'm wondering how you came to, to have those regrets uh, and how you now think about trade. And, and, and uh, was there anything that you saw in Xi Jinping when you spent time with him that struck you or that sh later on you realized, aha, that was uh, an aha moment that I should have had but I didn't have mm -hmm. or I did have and I wish I had... I think the scales have fallen from all our eyes over China over the last few years. But um, as recently as 2015, it was still possible to be optimistic about China. Maybe we were fooling ourselves, but it was still possible to be optimistic about China. I mean, the English translation of Xi Jinping's speech to the Australian Parliament talked about China being fully democratic by mid-century. Now, obviously what he meant by fully democratic and what we mean by fully democratic are two different things, but the fact that his translators chose to use those words was surely significant. Um, since then, the hide and bide mask has well and truly dropped. We've seen, as I say, uh, uh, the incarceration of maybe a million Uyghurs. Uh, we've seen the crushing of Hong Kong. We've seen the belligerence against all the neighbours. And most recently, we've seen not just uh, the intimidation of Taiwan, but we've seen the weaponisation of trade against Australia. Now, for us, uh, a freer trade deal with China was easy because we've always been a very open, free trading country. So uh, we didn't have too many barriers to drop. Uh, the Chinese did drop quite a lot of their barriers to us as part of this deal. So it was, I thought, a, a very good deal for Australia and I don't regret it. But there's absolutely no doubt that we wouldn't do it again, uh, given the changed circumstances. And uh, we've recently had something like $20 billion worth of our trade with China arbitrarily stopped on bogus health and safety grounds. And uh, what that's brought home to us is that as far as China's concerned, trade is just politics by other means. Uh, trade is weaponised as a way of trying to secure China's long-term strategic objectives. And in talking about trade being weaponized by China, uh, you've, you've spoken, you've written in The Australian about uh, the, the, the growing national security aspects of trade and how mm. you ha now have to consider uh, trade deals, how you have to consider trade relations. Uh, uh, just wondering your thoughts uh, more broadly on that. Well, I'm certainly not against trading with China. I'm in favour of trading with China. But I do think it's important to reduce our dependence on China, our vulnerability to China. Uh, so uh, we do not want to be uh, needing China for anything that is absolutely critical to our long-term future, because if we are dependent on China for that, we could suddenly find ourselves deprived of it when we need it most. So if uh, I were an Australian business, I wouldn't want to have China in my supply chains uh, for anything really important that I couldn't at a pinch get readily from somewhere else. And I think it'd be pretty important for American businesses to try to be in the same position. And I think we need to be careful, given China's propensity to steal our intellectual property, we've got to be very careful about selling critical things. Mm -hmm. Uh, to China, given that that might then work to our 
grievous long-term disadvantage. Another trip, you, uh, talking about international trade, you took that uh, garnered major headlines around the world was your, your trip this summer to India where you mm -hmm. sat down and talked to Prime Minister Modi. And uh, after the trip, you wrote uh, that uh, the answer to almost every question about China is India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Look, uh, India is a wonderful country. I first went to India as a student on my way to England mm -hmm. back in 1981. I spent three months roaming around uh, India. Uh, and I've had a fascination for the place ever since. India is a democracy under the rule of law, sometimes a bit of a creaky rule of law, but hey, uh, our own courts can be pretty slow sometimes as well. But it's a, it's a robust, rumbustious uh, democracy under the rule of law um, to a great extent with the English language as well. So India has always been, if you like, a more natural partner for countries like America and Australia than, than China, uh, particularly while China remains a one-party state, a dictatorship of the so-called proletariat. And, and I think India is now uh, starting to take off economically in the same way that China was taking off a couple of decades back. Um, when I was there in India, just a couple of months back, uh, something like 50 Indian cities are in the process of installing metro rail systems at the moment. Uh, the great cities of India are now just about all connected with the uh, motorway standard roads. Um, India uh, is uh, one of the world's great IT centres now. Now, I remember back in the early 80s when I was there, um, the Grand Trunk Road from Delhi to Calcutta was still a two-lane highway with bullet carts on it. So, so India is transforming itself and that old cliche about India, it is a country of great potential and will always be a country of great potential, I think is now uh, passing. I think that was what also used to say that about Brazil as well, mm -hmm. but in India it's, it's changing. And, and, and talking about uh, India, you're your predecessor, uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, essentially um, pulled out of the Quad. Maybe it's an overstatement, but under his leadership, the Quad uh, became a dormant organization. Mm. It has now uh, come back in a big way. We see it. Uh, we see not just uh, uh, cooperative uh, military exercises. We've seen uh, this initiative now to uh, produce and eventually distribute vaccines mm. in Southeast Asia. Mm. We see. Uh, the attempts to make uh, progress on supply chain management, uh, um, uh, computer chips and the like. Mm. Um, just wondering your thoughts generally on the Quad and its, its significance to Australia in particular. You're right. The uh, previous government to mine did uh, very much upset the Indians. There was the uh, reversal of the Howard era deal to sell uranium to India and yes there was the effective suffocation of the Quad for a period. I, I'm delighted that I was able to start the revival process. Prime Minister Modi is a very very significant Indian leader, uh, a very very substantial figure and uh, I have a lot of admiration and respect for Prime Minister Modi and look, all credit to my successors who have uh, really continued to, to develop the Quad and uh, all credit to India uh, for appreciating the importance, particularly at this time, of the democracies standing together uh, for peace and freedom and a rules-based global order. I think it's very important. Um, India is, is about to overtake China as the world's most populous nation and it is clearly the emerging democratic superpower and isn't it wonderful to think that we might have two democratic superpowers rather than just one. In, in, in talking about your appreciation for your successors, uh, 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 you noted when the uh, Australia-UK-US uh, security partnership uh, was recently announced, uh, you wrote that quote in making, in the Australian, you wrote in making the historic decision for nuclear powered submarines, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister has shown leadership of the very highest quality. And you also, in an interview you did with the Australian Broadcast Corporation, you said the biggest decision, you described the AUKUS decision, or the decision to 
create AUKUS, which really was an Australian-led initiative, mm -hmm. as, quote, the biggest decision that any Australian government has made in decades, as it indicates that we are going to stand shoulder to shoulder with the United States and the United Kingdom in meeting the great strategic challenge of our time, which obviously is China. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it, it, it was, uh, the announcement was, I think, was absolutely unexpected mm -hmm. uh, here in Washington, and certainly unexpected in Paris, which we can, we can uh, turn to uh, in a second. But uh, just want to get your sense of uh, the motivation behind it, what it means for the future of Australia as a, a, as a national security power. It was an extraordinary decision, uh, a decision that I wish I had been able to make in my time as Prime Minister, but all credit to Scott Morrison for being able to do this. And yes, I, I do genuinely believe that it is the biggest decision any Australian government has made in decades. And it, it is one of those rare moments when a middle power such as Australia can actually shape the thinking and the direction of much larger powers such as the United States. So, uh, so look, a, a, a great moment. Our challenge, though, is to try to ensure that the crown jewel of AUKUS, namely the acquisition by Australia of a nuclear-powered submarine, doesn't happen in a decade or two's time. It happens in a year or two's time, and that's why I am extremely keen to explore um, informally because I don't speak for the government on this, but extremely keen to explore uh, the prospects for us acquiring uh, a retiring American or British nuclear submarine or two almost immediately and running this uh, or these as operational training boats uh, under an Australian flag, under an Australian captain, uh, but maybe with a blended crew, um, getting these operational almost immediately uh, so that they are actually adding uh, to the order of battle in the Western Pacific because uh, we need more and better submarines now. We need them now. Um, and if in five or 10 or 20 years time, they can be the very latest uh, astute or Virginia class submarines, great. But if it is possible, uh, and I don't see why it wouldn't be to extend the life of some existing LA class boats or the two Trafalgar class submarines which are due to be retired by the Royal Navy in the next 12 months or so, let's do it because that gives Australia a sovereign capability that we currently lack. And given the vicissitudes of politics, uh, given uh, the time for decisions and revisions that a minute can reverse, uh, I won't feel comfortable that we really have made this transition uh, to a nuclear-powered uh, undersea fleet until we actually have one of them under the Australian flag. Yeah, that, that would be a major development. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, significant strategically. It would be mm -hmm. significant operationally. Uh, and in particular, because at current, uh, the notion is that those nuclear submarines might not be available till 2040, mm. and we in the United States also don't really have the, the capability uh, on the manufacturing side, though the construction is supposed to be in Australia, but even to assist it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's quite a, a high challenge, and in some ways, it, 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 and, it, and it also would take longer than the proposed uh, French uh, yep. diesel-powered submarines yep. we're going to take. So this, yep. this, would, this would be... Uh, this would be an extraordinary development and certainly welcome in, in many corners here in Washington. Let, let me ask you about, about the AUKUS uh, agreement itself. Uh, now, the Canadians themselves, I've heard ca Canadians express some concern that the Australia-UK-US grouping uh, creates sort of two classes of people within the Five mm -hmm. Eyes Intelligence Sharing uh, Alliance, which includes obviously US, UK, Australia, Canada and New Zealand. And do you see there being a danger of creating a, a, a two-speed uh, five eyes as a result? No, I think this AUKUS deal complements all the other things that are happening. It complements the five eyes, it complements the quad. Um, it certainly strengthens Australia, but it enables Australia to be a more substantial member of all the other things that we're doing, such as the quad, such as the five eyes, such as our ASEAN partnership and so on. So I always think that if your friends are stronger, that's better for you and Australia will be a stronger friend uh, once this AUKUS deal is brought to fruition.
Now, there, now there are some differences in strategic outlook. It, it, what's quite amazing to me when I look at uh, the United States and Australia, we have been together in, in World War I, mm -hmm. World War II, South Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And Australia is, you, you folks from here in Washington, you guys are literally at the other end of the mm -hmm. earth, but there is a commonality mm -hmm. of uh, strategic outlook. Uh, there's even a commonality of culture in some ways mm -hmm amongst us that, that's remarkable. Uh, and, and you've seen it with uh, the current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, both under President Trump uh, and also under uh, President Biden. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's interesting, in a sense, you know, and I, I was just recently reading uh, Winston Churchill's The Sinews of Peace, in which he talks about the fraternal association of the English-speaking mm -hmm. peoples and how mm -hmm. important that is to, uh, uh, to the future of the fight, of fight for freedom. New Zealand does, is not quite on the same page when it comes to China and, and, and not quite on the same page as it comes to other strategic threats as, as the United States and Australia are. I think it's fair to say. Yes, but don't underestimate the Kiwis. Uh, in, a, in a tight spot, the Kiwis will come good. Um, when I was PM, uh, my counterpart in New Zealand was the wonderful John Key. and. Uh, when we were thinking of how to respond to the, to the Islamic State challenge in northern Syria and Iraq, John Key unhesitatingly contributed, I think, 100 New Zealand soldiers to the 400 that we put into the Taji training exercise. Uh, to the best of my recollection, there were New Zealand special forces involved with ours uh, uh, training um, and assisting the Iraqi uh, special forces and so on. So look, um, there's a sense in which the Kiwis can afford to be a little bit more laid back about things because anyone who wants to do them harm has got to come through Australia first. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the Canadians perhaps can be a little bit relaxed because um, America is always there for them. Uh, even if it didn't want to be, it can't help being there for them because of the geography. Uh, but. Yeah, in the end, there is, there is a fundamental community of interest. And yes, when I was, when I was PM, I took the view that uh, the leader of the free world is the President of the United States. And my job, at least on foreign policy and defence and security matters, uh, was to do everything I could to make the life of the leader of the free world easier, not harder. I think I said to President Obama, when I met him for the first time in the Oval Office, um, I am not here to criticise you. I am not here to ask for anything. I am here to say, what can we do to help? And I suspect there aren't many people that see the President of the United States wanting to help as opposed to carp or demand. Very, very uh, interesting. Uh, um, uh, talking about uh, uh, demanding or uh, the, the French, who are also very present uh, uh, in your neighborhood, are a, a critical South Pacific power uh -huh. uh, with uh, significant military capabilities, obviously significant uh, French populations, uh, literally uh, not too far from Australia. They were, they were obvious, they were, they were taken aback by the AUKUS agreement, uh, quite upset. Uh, not just about the cancellation of the uh, submarine contract, but more broadly about w what they saw as uh, a statement about uh, the strategic investment they had made in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering uh, about the future of French-Australian relations, uh, mending the fences, how that, what, what you would suggest doing mm -hmm. on that score. Well, the first thing I should point out is that the contract that we signed with the French had lots of exit ramps and all we've done is take one of the contractual exit ramps that we were perfectly entitled to take. And whatever we are required to pay to the French under the contract, we will certainly pay. And if that's hundreds of millions of dollars, we will gladly pay it because uh, that's what they are owed. Um, the other thing I probably should say is that um, uh, Australia has uh, done its bit for France over the years. We mentioned the Great War earlier. Oh. 
there are 46,000 Australians that lie, buried, that lie buried in northern France uh, because that was our contribution to keeping France free in the First World War. Uh, the village of Pozier, uh, no place on earth is more thickly sown with Australian blood than the village of Pozier and the surrounding fields. And I think the French know that. Um, there is a, a village in northern France called Villers Bretonneur, uh, which the Australians uh, uh, protected in the great last great German offensives of, uh, of 1918. And there's a sign to this day over the uh, school in the village of Villers Bretonneur. I won't try to say it in French yeah. because I'd mangle it, uh, but it says, never forget Australia. Now, just at the moment, the French are probably not forgetting us in a <laughs> bad way, but uh, I think generally speaking, they don't forget us in a good way. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good to hear about the, the, the lasting character of the relationship and how critical it is. Let me ask you, as, as there's been some talk about uh, the Quad, and, and in particular some French strategists have suggested uh, figuring a way to incorporate both the, the UK and France somehow into, into the Quad as uh, either principal partners uh, yeah, to, 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 to really have a key relationship, uh, and your thoughts on that? Well, uh, it's really not up to Australia to decide who's in the quad because the other members uh, need to uh, need to have uh, their say on that. Personally, if the quad were to become a quint, I'd be very happy. Uh, and it was great to see the HMS Queen Elizabeth carry a strike group uh, in. Um, Western Pacific waters recently. Great to see that Britain is taking a very strong interest in uh, what the British call the Far East, what we Australians call the Near North. Mm -hmm. um, and look, likewise the French. I think there was a French aircraft carrier yes. operating in the Western Pacific uh, in the last few months as well. And I think both the British and the French aircraft carrier groups exercised with the Americans and the Japanese uh, and with the Indians. Yeah. So. Uh, Look, uh, anything that brings the free countries uh, together at this time is well worth pursuing. And, and Annette, let me ask you about the, uh, the notion uh, which you've talked about in the past about bringing Japan mm. into the Five Eyes uh, arrangement. Uh, um, you obviously had a, a very special relationship with Prime Minister Shinzo mm -hmm. Abe uh, in your term in office. and. Uh, you sought to bring about the, the submarine deal originally with uh, uh, a Japanese partner to construct the, uh, the, the, uh, the diesel-powered submarines. And uh, it was uh, your successor, I guess, Malcolm Turnbull, who signed, eventually signed the agreement with, uh, the, with the Chantier Naval and the French. But uh, you, uh, you, uh, your sense of the Japanese and, and why you think it would be helpful to incorporate them in the Five Eyes? Well, Japan is a very, very serious country. Uh, it's a massive economy. It's the world's, still the world's third biggest economy. It's, uh, they have a very substantial military, notwithstanding the 1% of GDP uh, uh, current uh, spending on defence. It was very interesting to note uh, statements from the Japanese leadership over the last few months that they would regard as an attack on Taiwan as an attack on Japan itself, which I suppose allows the Japanese self-defence forces to act in defence of Taiwan if necessary. So look, they're a very, very serious country. Um, I was keen back in 2014 to uh, obtain submarines from Japan because they have skin in the game. Uh, their submarines are uh, patrolling waters that are also patrolled by Chinese and Russian submarines. I can't imagine the Japanese would put their crews to sea in a substandard boat. And I figure if uh, the boat was good enough for Japan, it would certainly be good enough for Australia. Now, that didn't come to pass, and something which I think ultimately is better uh, is going to come to pass, the acquisition of a nuclear-powered submarine, either via Britain or via America. But nevertheless, I think the closest possible strategic uh, partnership with Japan is important uh, for the future of the free world right now. And if that means bringing Japan into the Five Eyes intelligence sharing network, I think that's all to the good.
And, and Australia and Japan have now uh, agreed to uh, the reciprocal access agreement. It's uh, Japan's first agreement covering a foreign military yeah. presence mm -hmm. in Japan since the Status of Forces Agreement with the United States back in uh, 1960. And, and hopefully this will mean that the uh, next talisman cyber uh, exercise uh, in central Queensland, which uh, every two years involves uh, uh, upwards of 20 or 30,000 mm -hmm. troops and dozens of ships and planes, uh, Hopefully, the next one will include a contingent from Japan. Very interesting. Let me, you, you also, look, you, you spent a significant amount of time, let me shift gears a little bit, in the UK. Mm. Both, uh, you know, both, uh, I guess, originally you were, you were born there and had UK citizenship. Mm -hmm. uh, you also were, were a Rhodes Scholar and, and studied there. And you're now, you now have a trade role mm -hmm. for the uh, UK government mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and, and, and the UK government has also sort of shifted gears particularly with regard to China, mm, mm. Uh, uh, under Boris Johnson, uh, after Hong Kong. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering on, the, on that score, you know, where you, see, where you, see, you know, the, the, there's, there's talk now of the UK seeking to uh, join the TPP, mm. wondering about uh, where you see that going, where you see and what you think the United States ought to do on TPP. It, it is great that Britain has uh, shifted gear, as you say, on, on China. And I guess, uh, uh, if anything, helped the scales to fall from their eyes, it was the Chinese abrogation of the One Country, Two Systems Treaty over Hong Kong. Just outrageous, absolutely outrageous. Showed complete contempt uh, for a treaty solemnly entered into uh, uh, with Britain. So look, uh, great that Britain has woken up to the peril uh, wonderful to see the HMS Queen Elizabeth uh, in Far Eastern waters. Uh, I hope we see both the Queen Elizabeth and the Prince Charles mm -hmm. in Far Eastern mm -hmm. waters uh, pretty, pretty regularly. And uh, look, uh, after the United States, uh, Britain is still the Western world's most substantial power. And to have Britain fully involved in our part of the world is all to the good. Great. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, it's, look, it's been, a, it's been an honor to have you with us here at Hudson Institute. Australia has been an important country for Hudson going back decades. Our founder, Herman Kahn, spent time there, wrote a book about it. Our, our senior fellow, John Lee, is based in Sydney, writes regularly in your papers and ours on, yeah. on Australia and Australia-U.S. relations. I just really want to thank you for taking the time uh, to visit and uh, to talk about uh, these incredible these incredibly important issues right after the, your uh, rather important visit to Taipei. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Pleasure to be with you.